Tonight, eligible voters in Cameroon go to the polls on the 7th of October 2018 to elect the new president in the Republic of Cameroon. It is contained in a presidential decree that was made public today, the 9th of July 2018. In this edition of the news, we talk about gunshots that kept the population of the southwest region of the country indoors. It was a chaotic atmosphere in Boya and other parts of the northwest and the southwest regions of the country. Also ahead, the United United Kingdom has actually cautioned nationals against traveling to the English speaking parts of the country. Those are headlines. We shall be right back. Stay with us. Good evening to you ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you back from the weekend. You are watching the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Equinox Television. Let's begin right away with one of the biggest news of the day. The much-awaited presidential election in Cameroon that is due to take place in three months from now. Cameroonian electors that have so far been convened by the President of the Republic. They would be going to the polls in about 90 days from now. The 2018 presidential election will take place on Sunday, the 7th of October 2018, and it's going to take place just for a single day. It is contained in a presidential decree made public today, the 9th of July 2018. Article 2 of the decree that was signed by the President of the Republic has stated that polls will be opened between 8 a.m in the morning to 6 p.m. It is coming 90 days to the election as stipulated by Section 86 of the country's electoral court. The presidential decree that was signed and made public today by the President of the Republic of the country. Meantime, tension took center stage today in Boya. Sounds of gunshots kept locals indoors since the early hours of this morning. It is still a chaotic atmosphere in the southwest regional headquarters of Boya as we speak. The clash between armed civilians and security forces has claimed the lives of several persons, though the exact facts and figures as to the number of people that are said to have died is still to be made public. One of those who stayed indoors is our reporter on the ground, Derek Jato, who managed to cable this report presenting the situation on the ground. Let's have details in the following story. Boya woke up this particular Monday with gunshot. Um, remember that before now there have been a lot of campaigns, a lot of outings from authorities, uh, canvassing and calling people to uh, come out this particular day and go about their activities normally. Uh, remember that uh, before today there was what the Boya Council may call an exchange, uh, saying that uh, he is preparing the ground and the security forces and the government uh, are equally preparing the ground for a smooth takeoff of the week this Monday. But uh, what we witnessed this particular Monday was uh, in terms of what uh, the people of Boya were promised. Uh, they woke up with gunshots. Uh, some of us, it has been impossible to even dare on the street to take the temperature of what is going on. But from a uh, hideout, we could vividly uh, see how uh, security forces are parading the street and gunshots. Well, as of now, as to whether they are just firing gunshots to scare or to send a message, we are not on the field to know who is shooting and why, but uh, we have been, Boya in general, have been witnessing a lot of gunshots and people reporting to uh, Equinox office are uh, saying that they are in their homes on their floor. And uh, it is not, not uh, easy on them even to uh, try to even, those who have external kitchen to even move out to look for something to eat because of the panic and the numerous gunshots they are getting. Uh, well, we have been seeing some disturbing uh, images on the social media, but Equinox cannot independently confirm that, of uh, buses that have been set on, on fire at mile 17 bus station, and we are equally getting a room of casualties. But what we are seeing Boya today, Boya has never uh, had such a picture with gunshots up to this hour. Derek Jato managed to cable the report. It was practically difficult for reporters, even those on the ground, to go 
and take a look at the situation in the southwest regional headquarters Subway and other neighboring localities as he said it was a chaotic atmosphere in the early hours of this morning and even as we speak it is in two weeks uh, that uh, the ghost town is taking a different twist in the southwest regional headquarters of Boya. The United Kingdom has cautioned, as we indicated earlier in this newscast, its citizens not to travel to some of the conflicted localities in the northwest and the southwest regions of the country. Let's have the details in the following report. The sounds of the gunshots were deafening and because of the chaotic atmosphere in mile 16, mile 17, Munya and several parts of Boya, locals had to remain indoors. Streets were no-go areas Monday in the southwest regional headquarter when the gunfight between security forces and unidentified armed civilians persisted. A GC marking center in Moliko was attacked. The markers sought refuge under the desk until the situation came under control. Following today's ghost town, several casualties were recorded, though an official statement on the exact number of lives lost is awaited. Buses belonging to renowned interurban transport agencies were set ablaze. A similar atmosphere prevailed in Bamenda, where several taxis were incinerated by unidentified individuals. Bamenda, Kumbu, Kumba, Tombel, and other major towns and villages in the northwest and the southwest regions were hit by ghost town and sporadic gunshots with casualties recorded. A never seen before situation on the day of a sitting strike in Anglophone Cameroon. As the crisis deepens, the United Kingdom in an outing Monday restricted its citizens from traveling to the Anglophone regions and said that traveling to Boya. Moyoka, Tiko, Kupe, Maninguba, Libya, Lem, Manu, and Meme divisions was unsafe as the army continued to clash with the separatists. And just to know that the situation is further deteriorating few hours to the implementation of the first phase of the humanitarian assistance plans of the President of the Republic to the affected population in the two Anglophone regions of Cameroon. The mayor of the Boya municipality, Mayor Patrick Ekema Esunge, in an outing that was uh, one a uh, few, few days ago, said that activities would go on normally, especially within his area of command this Monday and promised tough times, especially to treat and transporters would fail to carry on with the activities normally within the municipality but that was not the situation today in that part of the country now the Boya Kumba highway has become a regular gun battlefield whenever armed civilians block the road the security forces would have to engage the gun battle just so that circulation can be restored as you are going to be seeing in the report coming next the clash between security forces defense forces and the pro-independence fighters in the two Anglophone regions of the country often take place far away from long lines of stranded vehicles. Babla Jonathan tells us more in the following story. Commuters stranded in Muyuka on the Boyakumba Highway in the southwest region of Cameroon. Separatist fighters in a gun battle with Cameroonian security and defense forces. These travelers have been here for more than five hours before the arrival of the armed forces. Bullets continue renting the air. Security forces dismantle barricades mounted by the separatist fighters while the travelers from Boya heading to Kumba and vice versa managed to make their way through. <laughs> the Boyakumba Highway will be opened just for a few hours and later blocked again by the separatist fighters. <laughs> This has compelled the military to escort vehicles from Boya to Kumba and Kumba to Boya to ensure the safety of the travelers. Almost all the villages along this highway, Ekona, Muyuka, 
Yoke, Idiki, Bakundu Banga, Balangi, Baron Bikang, and others are bent down and are deserted. Just how the Anglophone crisis leaves actors in the transport sector in the two Anglophone regions of the country stranded. Now, we talk about the ghastly road accident which occurred along the Yaoundi Buddha Highway that left uh, dozens of persons dead, dead. It is still a bitter pill for many to swallow. The governor of the central region, Nasir Paul Bia, actually held a meeting today to sensitize actors in the transport sector in that part of the country. He urged passengers to limit risks of by obtaining travel tickets from legal agencies he equally called on the parties involved in road transport to play their respective roles details with Inons and Aze. Nasiri Paul Bia, governor of the central region, has issued official statistics regarding the number of persons who died in the road accident early July 6 involving a 30-seater bus along the national road number 4 linking Yaoundé and Bafusam. On that accident you had 31 people who died and uh, uh, four others were still in the hospital in Jiki. One was at the Bafusam. The deadly road accident which occurred around the locality of Nkong Yambeta in the Mbaman Inubu division of the central region and claimed the 31 lives has been blamed on the driver and proprietor of the illegal inter-urban transport agency. We are blaming the drivers, blaming the proprietors, blaming even the passengers. And we want them to know that if you want to travel, you should be able to go to the right agency. Go where you, you, they will give you a ticket and where you will have the, uh, your name on the list of passengers. Because if you don't have your name on the list of passengers, anything happens, it becomes difficult. Governor Nasiri Paul Bia expressed deep sympathy and cautioned parties involved. For now, it is a horrible and a regrettable situation which we will not like that it would occur again. So we are asking both passengers, proprietors and everybody to do his own part of the work. Even the people of the control should be able to verify that the documents of the vehicle, the driver's license and everything should be in good state. The governor did not see the nature of Cameroonian roads as major cause of the accident. Children were on board the 30 seater bus that was heading to Mbuda from Yaoundé. We now talk health some localities in the north region of the country that has been hit by a cholera outbreak. About three persons have been diagnosed of cholera in the locality of Mayu Ulu, that is a district in the northern part of the country. And for me, Armstrong Sandine, the following report is going to be presenting some of the poor hygiene and sanitation conditions favoring the outbreak of cholera. His report. The outbreak of cholera is not new in Cameroon. In 2010, for example, eight of the country's ten regions were affected by a cholera outbreak which resulted in 657 deaths. Eighty-seven percent of those affected were in the far north region of the country considered vulnerable to the spread of the disease. Why do we have a cholera in, in, in this region? It's be only because of the lack of access to proper uh, water. So when you are, you are in, a, in a zone where there is no uh, proper water, you have a lot of chance to have uh, the cholera. And you know in the, in the far north there are a lot of uh, places where you, can, you don't, cannot have a, a good water to drink. Though caused by the consumption of contaminated water and food, cholera is often spread as a result of poor sanitation and hygiene. The first thing is the hygiene of the hands. When you cannot uh, wash your hands very well before, before and after eating, when you go to the toilet and after you cannot wash your hands and after you come you, you greet the people with the hand, these this, uh, manners uh, contribute to the rapid spread of this uh, of this of potentially 
cholera is a series of infectious disease and can cause high mortality. It has the potential to spread rapidly depending on the context and how exposed is the population. Yes, dirty water, but the dirty water who is infected by the Vibrio cholera. You can drink the dirty water, but there is no Vibrio cholera inside, so you can, we will not have uh, the disease. But Recently, reports say some parts of the north region have been hit by a new cholera outbreak. Three cases were reported in Dumu and Giviza Health Unit of Mayo Ulu Health District. Considering the realities in this part of the country, government is expected to take rapid measures in order to stop the disease from spreading like in 2010. And on our advertorial page tonight, the National Oil Refinery Company, the Sonara, has signed an agreement to revamp activities at the Cape Limbo Petroleum Terminal with the Port Authority of Douala and the Faco Transport Shipping Company Limited. This concession agreement aims at uh, fortifying the party's industrial activities and to withstand competition and generate fabulous income as far as the company is concerned. Let's have the details in this report. It was indeed a solemn ceremony Thursday, June 28, that grouped authorities of the National Oil Refining Company Sonora, Port Authority of Douala, Faco Transport and Shipping Company Limited, Faco Ship, and host of others, including officials from the Ministry of Transport, for the signing of the concession agreement of towing and mooring activities at the Cape Limbo Petroleum Terminal. The importance of this agreement may be viewed not only on the companies concerned, but more especially on the activities involved. Moving and towage at our oil terminal are vital for the exploitation of Sonara. Concretely, they play an unprecedented role in the competitiveness of our company because they are a must for the reception of a big vessel transporting our raw material, crude oil, and the expedition of final petroleum products. The process to bind Sonara, Fakoshi, and the Port Authority of Douala commenced five years ago. The agreement goes into effect this 2018 with golden advantages like guarantee of smooth conduct of operations, considerable financial gain to be made and provision of a stability that will better adapt to the party's industrial activity. Given that, the duration of the concession agreement has been baptized with 10 years with the possibility of amending it every three years. The present concession agreement will surely guarantee competitivity of our respective companies and at the same time it represents a symbol of a fruitful and friendly collaboration between our companies. According to the general manager of the Port Authority of Douala, this concession agreement is distinct from others. It is the first concession in which the concessionaire is a company whose capital is wholly owned by nationals. The combined effect of the competition department in the context of the restriction international tender added to the experience of partnership in the field of touring and moving with another drop a drop in the cost of touring and moving services in Sonora of at least fancy for two million compared to the level in 2017. The number of direct jobs guaranteed by this concession is 60, of which 10 executive positions. And this tripartite agreement enters a historic book. It marks a milestone in the life of our three companies, the Port Authority of Guala, Faco Ship, and Sonara, all of which are working very hard to achieve the emergency of our beloved country, Cameroon, come 2035, as prescribed by our illustrious head of state, 
His Excellency Paul Bia. All three parties are now ready to curb the challenges lying ahead of them to attain the goals of the concession agreement. <laughs> And a lot to talk about in the ongoing World Cup taking place in Russia surprises, expectations, and missed chances. Smart Njikan Gabriel, in just a few seconds from now, takes us to Russia. We shall be right back. The 2018 World Cup taking place in Russia is still ongoing. We are preparing or breezing for the semi final stage. Smart Jikan Gabriel, four teams to go. We have Croatia, England, Belgium, France. Those are the four teams that are still standing strong as far as this competition is concerned. So far, what can we retain as far as the teams left in the competition is it concerned? Yes, over the weekend, good evening, Mimi. And over the weekend, I just want to say that four teams were finally left in that competition. Many people term the World Cup now as a European affair after the two South American teams were eliminated. So these are the four standing teams uh, that are left in the World Cup. We represented them with their players. We have uh, the likes of uh, Croatia, England, and of course uh, uh, France, uh, Belgium. These are the four players. We represented them in terms of their countries. Sure. We have Harry Kane, we have uh, De Bruyne, we have Mbappé, we have uh, uh, the young Croatian man that they call Modric. These are the three, four countries that are standing strong in the World Cup as we speak. And it is an all-European affair. No South American or no African country sure. or no Asian country left in the competition. And so far, talking about training France and Belgium must be intensifying preparations ahead that, of the semi-final matches. Yes, they are intensifying trainings and for now there is no injury uh, scare for the both teams. Uh, Belgium and France, they were on the pitch today to train ahead of their clash. Tomorrow, it should be noted that uh, France will be going in as the youngest squad of the tournament. Uh, the first eleven of France, they are very young. And in, uh, Belgium will be getting into that competition as the most offensive side of the competition. They have scored more goals than any other. And Belgium should be recalled were the only side to have left the group stage without a defeat and they have continued their journey till date so they had their first they had their training session before the match of uh, tomorrow and that match will be coming up at 7 p.m cameroon time and other important personalities to look out for we have the referees to handle uh, some of uh, the encounters as far as the competitions are concerned well this one i say south american referees have been so wonderful with france remember it's a south american referee that uh, took care of the match between france and uruguay and now again it is another south American referee from Uruguay. Unfortunately, I don't know whether it's unfortunately or fortunately bad. It is from a country that France actually eliminated at the uh, knockout stage of the competition. And the referee's name is uh, Andreas Kuncha. He is the one to handle the game between France and Belgium. And before this France game, he has also handled a match between France and Australia. So mm. France team should know this man so well. And maybe uh, may many people and, say since he's from Uruguay. FIFA, FIFA, of course, that is retaining <laughs> referees of uh, the final round yeah fifa has already made it very clear we already now know the number of uh, referees that will be left in this competition that have reduced right mm. they have reduced the number of officials of the world cup in the final phase we now have 12 referees 26 assistants 10 video assistants who have been selected if many people were thinking they will leave so many of them but fifa surprised everybody to just keep 12 referees 26 assistant referee and 10 video assistant referees who are left in the competition for now a good number of uh, teams might be standing out like we said earlier but we have uh, top goal scorers uh, in the competition this far Smanji and Gebre, you must have hurricane been hurricane keeping didn't records of that yeah hurricane didn't score in their last match but he is still leading the top uh, goal the route to the golden boot as we put it we see half hurricane and uh, maybe the only competitor the only person who can be a real threat to hurricane is romelu lukaku of uh, belgium he will be playing again tomorrow he has four goals if he can score three goals then he might meet up with hurricane or even pass hurricane but for now hurricane of england is standing very tall to become the golden boot winner at the end of this competition so we are still having our hands full dates mm -hmm. fingers crossed sure. to see what will happen in that encounter maybe in their match of coming up tomorrow but uh, Romelu Lukaku will have the opportunity to leapfrog Hurricane if he scores tomorrow to move up the ladder. I call the, the encounter between Croatia and Russia as one of the most emotional 
uh, encounter so far as far as the competition is concerned. You know, Russia, the host country, many were expecting that uh, Russia could make it to the semi-finals of uh, the competition. Let us come back to the review of that encounter. It was a great game for Russia, Croatia, but you know, it was uh, a match that many people thought the 12 fan, uh, the 12 player would be the fans of Russia, but at the end of the day, Russia actually fought for that game. They thought they were going to continue the way they did uh, when they eliminated uh, the likes of Spain in the, uh, the, uh, the knockout phase, but this time around, Croatia was so, so wonderful with uh, their penalty shootout. And of course, Ivan Rakitic uh, bringing the last, uh, putting the na last nail on the coffin of uh, Croatia or, or Russia in that match. So Croatia uh, went through thanks to penalty shootout, post-match penalty shootout. And maybe we'll just hurry up to say that the weekend was filled with several other matches. We of have course. the England versus Sweden, Sweden. encounter. Sure. That match also was a great game, but many people felt that it was one of the most boring encounter that they watched in the course of this World Cup. Yeah. Many people thought that. It is not my view. But uh, the match ended in favor of uh, England. They defeated Sweden by two goals to zero. Unfortunately, Harry Kane was not on target in that game. And maybe the other match that actually pulled a lot of ten uh, sensation and attention is the match Belgium, between Brazil, Bra Brazil and Belgium. Yeah, sure. It was a game that many people expected to see the fireworks of Nima. Unfortunately, Nima da Silva uh, Jr. couldn't do anything uh, possible for his country to move up to the next stage of the competition. So, Brazil is out. Belgium beat Brazil by two goals to zero and the goals were scored. We have uh, a guy like De Bruyne who scored one of the goals and of course, it was a heavy, uh, happy Red Devil squad that left the competition or put out Brazil in that uh, competition. And we see a bigger head falling as Bigger far as the competition is concerned bad history especially for some top countries uh, uh, that were involved in the competition it is the first time that we have countries like brazil argentina and of course uh, the likes of germany leaving the competition at the level of the knockout phase it's the very first time the selection of brazil and of course uh, we have the likes of uh, the uh, the abbey celeste of argentina and also the national manshaft of uh, germany who left the competition in a premature manner is the first time we are having that competition do history will have it that for the first time these top nations left the competition at the level of the knockout phase it has never happened and let us uh, just for us to know that after the disaster performance of the Spanish national football team. The federation has now named Luis Enrique as the replacement of a Herrero. That who, was fast. That, yeah, it, was a, it is a fast one because, you know, they, before the competition, they had to sack their coach because he signed with Real Madrid. The person they brought to replace him couldn't deliver now they have brought in a former uh, Barcelona head coach who has a lot of titles on his head, Louis Enrique. Many are hoping that he's going to actually meet up with the standards. And just for us to remind our friends, our viewers out there, about the fixtures of the upcoming semi finals. I know many people already know, but we have France and Belgium. They'll be opening the game tomorrow, 9, 10, uh, that is 7 p.m. Cameroon time. And of course, uh, Wednesday, Croatia will confront. England, finally this evening, to tell you that after the World Cup, after the uh, group matches and the knockout phases, there are two sta or four stadiums that we're going to forget, we're going to beat farewell. We have the stadiums of Nizhny no Novgorod, they, are, they will not be using that pitch again. The Samara Arena will not also have to use it again. And we also have another uh, one, the stadium of Sochi, that will not be using it again. Now, the last uh, field is the Arena, Kazan Arena. Those are the pitches that have been left aside and the competition continue with or two other pitches. Thank you so much, Sumanji Kangebru, for the updates from Russia as far as the World Cup is concerned. Thank you so much. We are going to have you again same time tomorrow. Tomorrow and uh, we're going to of look course. at the head-to-head -head confrontation before the game. Belgium. A and lot of stakes involved. That is it. Because we don't know who is well in the competition. And in the second part of this newscast, we are going to be talking about the just published presidential decree that is convening electors in the country. How is ELECCAM ready to organize uh, the presidential elections across the national territory? What are the implications and what would happen between now to the time that the elections will take place? We are having information from the center region of the country that the principal opposition political party, the Social Democratic Front, has convened a press conference that was a few minutes ago. We shall be right back in a moment.
Once again, good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, to our guest tonight, Mr. Ako John Ako. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, it's short you, notice. Mimi for this uh, brief invitation. Thank you so much. We have for the uh, Cameroonian electors that have been convened by the President of the Republic. The date of uh, the presidential election is known. It's going to take place on the 7th of October 2018 across the national territory. First question is, what is going to be the implication of this presidential decree and the presidential election? Yeah, the first is that with the coming of the presidential decree on calling on the Electoral College will include calling or calling on parties to present their candidates which you have seen there equally announcing the date when campaign will equally start and secondly when voting will resume in the same light it is equally presenting that within the arena of what as elecam is concerned elecam has to publish the official list of those who are already voters i mean in the revision of the electoral list and closing registration for any other potential voters. So there is a lot the moment the presidential decree comes out and announces the dates of the election. So those who are within the, how can I call the triangle of Cameroon, those that elections are set up for the 7th of October and that there will be no longer registration, the political parties are called to present their candidates mm -hmm. and what not, when really campaign will start. Do you think that it came as a surprise to Cameroonians, given the fact that the President of the Republic is still to promulgate or, or put into force the prolonging of the mandate or extension of mandate of members of Parliament in Cameroon? We still do not know about uh, municipal executives in the country. And the President himself has not declared his intention as to whether he's going to be a presidential candidate in the country. Was it a surprise to Cameroonians? It might be a surprise to many Cameroonians, but as an intellectual, from the time I heard there was a debate on the uh, prolonging or the uh, prolongation of the mandate, extension of the mandate of members of parliament and senators, it equally, or parliamentarians, it equally gives me an impression that we're not going to have this as far as presidential elections were concerned. So it was just but normal. In fact, I even embarrassed a colleague I was discussing with, I said the president, the president has less than eight days to convoke the Electoral College. That is just my statement this morning. So to me, I believe there was no surprise because I knew that elections were eminent in October, except for those who were not aware. Because this is the last parliamentary session we are having before October. If there was anything to extend the mandate of the president, that would have been done. If not, I knew that he was going to come out in this similar gesture. And you know, the country where we live is a country where we live with factism, a lot of fraud, egoistic and self-standard tendency that whenever Cameroonians go into the pool or creating an election, it's an atmosphere where those who think they're in power should cement or continue living while at the mercy of others. But I believe within Cameroonian standard, it is quite disgracing and embarrassing that in the present atmosphere of Cameroon, we can still think of election. We spoke here some time ago, there is no need for election in 2018. Looking at the three cardinal points or the four cardinal points of Cameroon, north, south, east, west, you realize that tension ranges all over. And we don't know where elections will be conducted, who are those who will be sent to the field, and a lot of other things. Are Cameroonians, it is a present issue of Cameroon's presidential election. Why has the president refused to get into the call of Cameroonians that we need to handle Cameroonian problems and keep these electoral issues apart? Cameroon is a state of law. Cameroon is a democratic nation. We need to manage it otherwise and let Cameroonians know that within us, within them, they can still continue. It is rather funny. We need to put the life of the citizens at the top rather than mingling with presidential elections or whatsoever. Of course, it is the electoral court that is being respected in the country. Many were expecting, obviously, that the electors are going to be convened by the president of the republic. The question is whether elections Cameroon, the elections governing body in the country, is prepared for this political battle. The election, election Cameroon, you remember, they have just changed his, uh, the composition of the team that make up that organ with a lot of inconveniences that they were going through. Again, how will they assess materially, financially? We don't know the stakes. We know under what circumstances the former director of electron, elections Cameroon was replaced and a lot of these other issues. Are we really there to serve Cameroonians? If elections were to serve the interests of Cameroonians, then everything must make sure and, uh, to know that in the political history of Cameroon, elections remain the overcrowning procedure that tells us whether this country is democratic or not, rather than downplaying 
to serve individual or personal interests. Cameroonians still need to learn. I will not believe that I will live to see my country in 60, 70 years' time still behaving as if elections started being organized in Cameroon two years ago or five years ago. This, as I said several times, that is a democratic state, but we realize now that it is a state of anarchy and dictatorship. And I believe there is time we must give chance to the citizens and individuals to express their views. I don't know the rule of the press. I don't know the rule of what we call the civil society actors or international organizations in Cameroon. The press has always done its job. The, yeah, that is what we I'm saying because I remembered I was taught by one professor on Doem at the University of Yaoundé too. He said freedom of expression will have no implication, no meaning if what individuals say or express does not affect decision taking. The moment we talk and nothing changes, then there is no need to tell Cameroonians that there is freedom of expression. It will equally tell me that, meaning the press hasn't or has nothing to do with the political atmosphere in Cameroon. There is a whole lot of things. If we have to pray, I believe the next thing is to pray for the intervention of heaven, is to pray for the Messiah that is going to liberate Cameroon from the mess of those who we call the 18th century rulers or the 20th, how can I call, the 14th century rulers. Talking about those to replace, uh, to, 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 to liberate Cameroon. Yeah, that's, that is what I'm saying. We have some emerging uh, opposition leaders as far as the 2018 political year in the country is concerned. What do you think about the opposition in the country? Yeah, I will, I will, I will not I will, not gain, I will not come much to say that within the political atmosphere, I, I have talked that with the likes of the youths like uh, Joshua C, it is possible that Cameroonians can go ahead and within it, I'm telling you that we have had an ambition of creating a platform of Cameroonian youth, what I call the Cameroonian youth movement, that will have a more implication that we let the youths get implicated and change their own destiny rather than allowing the old age outdated adult to decide for them we cannot come to a country like cameroon where we accept that 60 percent of the population are the youth but when you look at the composition of the government look at the composition of members of parliament or the senators whatsoever directors and head of services how many youths do we have life in cameroon begins after 60 meaning when you are in your mother's home those who have bachelor's master's degree will still wait that until 50 years 60 years can they own or hold political offices in cameroon i believe with uh, the present of joshua see if time permits us will be you seem to have chosen your candidate no it is not like choosing i'm just simply telling you that when we talk of the youth movement in cameroon this is an eminent youth and i believe it's going to do greatly for cameroonians if we have to but on one side i said i am not first okay with the timing of the elections cameroonians must learn to handle cameroonians problem first before getting to the elections but with the youth movement i believe youth's implication one of the most eminent is Joshua if, C. If and I believe get, if youths get involved, don't you think that uh, uh, the situation in the country that you termed chaotic could normalize? That is what I'm saying. That within my own ambit, what I'm doing now is coordinating the youths and getting them know that this country belongs to them. We cannot allow those who are at 80 years to make decisions for those who are 25. A father that is at 80 knows nothing about the present world changes. And that is why we are seeing that our brothers and sisters are being killed. Because today, dialogue is the ultimate instrument for democracy. There is no democratic nation in the world. Talk less of the Europeans. Like a president or whosoever will take arms against his own very people. It is not done. But when we spend huge amount of state coffers, say we are fighting our own self, I believe, and I still think, any youth that was at this problem, I tell you, there's still the person I called Joshua, he said, inclusive dialogue, he has said that, and these people are Cameroonians, we must talk to them. If we can negotiate with Boko Haram in the north to release the French, the priests, and whatsoever foreigners, why can't we talk with Cameroonians who are having a pertinent problem? That is what I'm saying, that youth presently would obviously reason differently from the generation past. So the Cameroon Youth Movement will be one of those platforms which I think many youths will get involved. And if not, we have to school ourselves very well the and make it successful. Has, has, been, has been providing solutions uh, as far as the crisis is concerned. Yeah, like the government, putting in place me, a humanitarian plan. The humanitarian to plan assist it is, affected in families. Fact, it is a futile solution. And as I said, I recommend it in several instances. Some people use the atmosphere to, gain poli to, to get political gains. Many are bringing out the same plans which they are going to manage. Some have contributed 10 million, they will be to manage the budget of 12 billion. And at the end, we will still have inquiries. Be very careful that the same plan they have given, at the end of the plan, we might have people who will be caught under what we call Operation Epervier to give us the sincerity of what they have managed. 
All these are futile solutions. These were not the recommendations tabled by the Bilingualism Commission. These were not the proposal tabled by the bishops. These are not the proposal tabled by the teachers or the lawyers association. There is a problem with this country when what people demand. Your child cannot ask you for a fish and you are giving him a snake and you call that you have satisfied the child. They are all wrong. And I'm telling you that all the decisions, when we see every time the decisions are taken, the situation on the field is instead getting worse. Where we are last two months is not what, where we are today. At the same time, we are talking of humanitarian plan. I have never seen a humanitarian plan that works in the atmosphere of war. In an instrument, in an atmosphere of war, what I have seen is the International Committee of the Red Cross. I have never seen humanitarian plan. Otherwise, we have to announce also ceasefire. And I said, most often than not, ceasefires are being done by those who declare war. There is and a need if for ceasefire. Can, there is a need for ceasefire. There is a need for those who are now in the bushes to come. This is what the government should do, rather than creating budget and loopholes for corruption and embezzlement. We are just going to see this. If we have to do it, some people announced to us that the plan was going operational this week and that they are going to do greatly and that the forces and the result, but I think you just have the images of what is happening in Boya, the Mike 17, the uh, Ekona and Munya. This is just today that they announced last week that they will be in the region to start implementing it today. I don't know to which extent this will really be successful. We still pray that God should guide the country, Cameroon. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Ako John. Ako, for joining us tonight on The Talk pleasure is mine. We we'll hope to have you some other time again. We'll always be together. Thanks, indeed, to our viewers. It was equally a pleasure having you with us in this edition of the Primetime Newscast on Equinox Television. Wishing you a blessed stay in the company of our programs. Until we meet again, goodbye.